Hi folks, this is Graham Popo from Couchbase, and today I'm very excited to announce the beta release of a project we've been beavering away on behind the scenes for quite some time now, which is Couchbase Distributed Acid Transactions. Uh, so this is going to be a whistle stop and very practical guide for you, the busy Java developer. It's going to include how to get started, what the API looks like, uh, and a very high level idea of what goes on behind the scenes. It's also going to include three very important best practices that you should apply in your application. I'm not going to be covering how transactions work in detail. Uh, I'm not going to be diving into uh, ACID, uh, as there are other blogs being released that cover that. Uh, today, I'm going to be focusing on the API. Uh, and I want to stress that you can get started with this API today, uh, right now. In fact, uh, couch-based transactions require zero new hardware. There's no new services to configure, and there's nothing new to set up on the cluster. You just add a line to your Gradle or Maven project to pull in the library, and you're good to go. Uh, we've got documentation for transactions, plus the Java API you'll see here, and I'll link to those below the video. And sorry to non-Java developers, our initial beta release is Java only, but we haven't forgotten you. Releases for other languages are very much on the roadmap, so watch this space. The example I'm going to look at uh, today is part of our public examples repository, which I'm also going to link below. Uh, I'm going to run through a simple, short example, uh, which is going to simulate a bank transferring an amount between two customers uh, and also creating a record of the transfer. It's going to do all these operations atomically as part of a transaction. Uh, I know this example is unrealistic. It's not how banks actually store financial records and transfers. Uh, but it's a useful, simplified example anyway. So let's dive into some code. Uh, we start off with some command line parsing that I'll skim past. Uh, and now we're going to open up the couch page resources. So the first thing you should know is that the Java implementation of couch based transactions is built upon the new 3.x series of the couch based Java client. Um, as the major version lead suggests, this does mean some API changes uh, and a little bit of porting work will be needed. Um, but the return for that is that you get a more performant and radically simplified API, plus access to both transactions and also the new synchronous replication feature that's also releasing with Couchbase 6.5. Um, if you're familiar with the current 2.x version of the Couchbase Java SDK, this is all going to look pretty familiar. Uh, we are opening a cluster. We're opening a bucket. Here we diverge a little bit. We're opening a collection a collection here. Uh, collections aren't the focus of this demo, so I won't spend too much time on them. Um, essentially, they allow a, a more granular grouping of documents than buckets, and they're a fe uh, feature coming in a future release of Couchbase Server. Uh, but we're aiming for forward compatibility with that future release in the SDK now, um, and it's also going to let you play with the feature during beta. Uh, for now, you can get started just by doing bucket.default collection to get a collection object back. And you can think of this for now as just doing operations on the bucket exactly as you do uh, currently with Couchbase. So that covers the normal Java Couchbase opening of resources. Let's get to the transactions. The first thing we do is create a transaction config. Now you can normally leave this at the defaults. They should be fine. Uh, here we are adjusting the durability level depending on what's been specified on the command line. Um, this controls how the new synchronous replication feature introduced in Couchbase Server 6.5 is used. Uh, again, that will be covered in other resources. Uh, the default for transactions is to set it at majority, meaning that transactions will wait for all writes to reach a majority of replicas before continuing. Um, after creating the config, we create the transactions object. It's important that each application only create one of these. Uh, each transaction object is starting an automatic background cleanup process as well, uh, which I'll touch on later. Uh, finally, this is optional, uh, but recommended. We subscribe to the new um, event bus provided by the Java client 3.x. We are listening for transaction events. Uh, so any important events, and I'll touch on one or two during this talk that could be raised, um, will be raised by transactions during this. And I strongly recommend that anything at one or above is logged somewhere that's going to be seen and uh, reviewed. 
So that's the end of transactions configuration. Uh, we set up some test data. We're going to create two customers here, Andy and Beth, both with a balance of 100. Um, and then we are ready to transfer. So transfer money does our transaction. So um, the first thing you'll see here is uh, you use the transactions object that you created earlier and call run on it. And you provide a lambda or a callback that is going to do the transactional logic. So the idea here is that you specify what you want to do and we will aim to do it. It's gonna free you from most explicit error handling, most retry logic. Um, so this is something I'm gonna come back to later, but it's an important uh, part of the API. So the Lambda gets provided with a transaction context. Uh, this is what you're gonna do all key value operations on inside the transaction. You can see we've got some reads, we've got some inserts, we've got some replaces. Um, we're gonna cover this Lambda in detail, but that's what you can expect from that. Um, so let's start off by getting our two customers. Uh, we have two ways of, of doing reads. You can do get or error if you know that the customer should exist. And if it does not exist, it will cause the transaction to fast fail. Uh, if the customer may or may not exist, you might prefer to use uh, a get here, which will return an optional instead of fast failing the transaction if the customer does not exist. But we presume our two customers exist here, so we use get or error. And transaction JSON document is a, an immutable structure. So to get the actual content out to that customer to be able to manipulate it, we use content as option as object. And that returns a JSON object that you are probably familiar with from SDK 2.x. I should note uh, that reads must be done inside of the transactional context. Uh, it uses a special transaction JSON document. Um, and this is used so we can determine if those customers are already inside another transaction. It's part of our right right conflict detection. Uh, so we've got our two customers. We've got the contents of the two customers. We have some logging. We pull out their current balances. Um, let's do a mutation today, a mutation now. So I want to create a record of this transfer. I want to record that uh, customer one has transferred some money to uh, customer two. Um, so this is the first mutation operation that we see. This is how you do an insert inside a transaction. You provide the collection. And I should note that all of the operations we're seeing here are all happening on one collection or uh, one bucket, essentially. Uh, but transactions can span collections, they can span documents, they can span buckets. There's no limitation there. So you insert, you provide the collection, you provide the ID, which is a UID here, and you provide the JSON that we're going to insert. Now, whenever you do a mutation inside a transaction, um, you should understand that it is doing some changes to the cluster. It is making some document changes at this point, but it is staging the mutation. It's not committing it. So at this point, immediately after this insert and before the, the transaction has got to the commit point, uh, if anything reads this document, and that includes reads inside a transaction, it includes regular key value reads, it includes nickel reads, uh, they will actually not see um, this data here because this has not been committed yet. Uh, so you will never see uncommitted data in any part of the Couchbase platform. That is what provides our Couchbase wide recommitted isolation model. Um, so we've inserted, which has staged the mutation but not committed it yet. Um, we have some conditional logic here and this seems simple, but just to briefly touch on a wider point, um, some of our competitors do require that you specify all of your transactional updates at once, or you perform any conditional logic using a complex query language or DSL. Uh, but we wanted to present a very simple API that allowed you to just use the same, the full power and flexibility of Java that you're used to. So conditional logic is as simple as just doing an F branch. So inside the F branch, we do some more logging. We're gonna update the, the customer's JSON. Um, so Andy is having the amount deprecated from his balance, Beth is gaining it. Um, and then we're gonna stage that mutation. 
So this is how you do a replace. You specify the original transaction JSON document that you got when you fetched the document, and you also specify the new, doc, the new content that you changed. So we fetched that out of the transaction JSON document here as a JSON object. We've modified it here, and now we're sending back the mutated data. Now, similarly to insert, this is going to stage a mutation at this point. So we are putting uncommitted data onto the cluster, but nothing is going to see it until the transaction is committed. And then at the end of that logic, once we've reached the end of the lambda, we've effectively committed. There's an implicit commit once we reach the end of the lambda. Uh, you're also free to explicitly commit as well. You can do context of commit. Totally optional, totally down to you. Um, and that is essentially the transaction. So as soon as you reach the commit point, um, atomically, other transactions are immediately going to see the data that we've busily staged. They're going to see the new version of Andy, the new version of Beth. They're going to be able to see the transfer record that we inserted here. Um, as there's a single point of truth for the transaction that gets atomically flipped as soon as we commit. Um, after that atomic flip point, the uh, stage mutations are um, physically written on the cluster as well. So uh, non-transactional reads are also going to see these changes. It's going to take a little bit longer. They're going to be, uh, they're going to see them eventually, but we're using eventual in the eventual consistency sense. In, the, in practice, they're going to see them very quickly, but they're not going to see them atomically. Uh, for uh, atomic reads, we want to be using transactional reads. So we've looked at a good path. We've looked at a good commit there. So what about some failures? Um, well, if you throw an exception inside the Lambda, um, that is going to cause everything that had happened so far to get rolled back. So we had staged, not committed, but staged some replaces and some inserts. Those will get rolled back. So it will be as though nothing had happened on the documents at all. Um, and then the transaction will fail. We'll end up in this transaction failed block. Uh, we threw in insufficient funds, which is our custom exception, um, because Andy did not have enough money to complete the transaction. And uh, you can use the get cause on the transaction failed to drill down on the exact cause. And how to handle that is variable. Uh, in this case, we just propagate it up so something higher up the stack can handle Andy not having enough money to do this by displaying an error or a to Andy or something like that. Um, here we handle a key not found, which is an exception thrown by get or error. So if one of our customers could not be found, we end up in transaction failed with a get cause a key not found. And here we decide to change that to a more useful error um, of customer not found and the customer exception. Um, finally, if there's an error that we don't understand, um, the most useful thing to do may be to simply log that to your own logger um, for future human review. Um, and th there could be some various causes. You might have a, a bug inside your Lambda that um, uh, could be causing some exception to be thrown or something of that ilk. Uh, there's also, um, we'll come back to error handling later, but essentially transactions will um, try and get your logic done for a set period of time that's configurable. And if it fails to do so, for example, if, if the server has gone through, uh, is in a failure state and is unable to get that transaction committed, then you can also end up in this transaction fail branch. Um, we also provide uh, inside the transaction failed, uh, you get a programmatic log. So you get all the logs related to that transaction that you can log, uh, which will may make it very easy for us to debug any issues that you see. Um, so that's handling explicit exceptions thrown. What about write-write conflicts? What about if I try and replace a document here and some other transaction is trying to modify the same document at the same time? Well, one of the transactions will detect that and it will uh, roll back everything that's done so far, it will roll back any stage mutations it's done, and it will retry. Uh, it will retry the entire transactional lambda. And it may fail again, it may have to roll back again, try again. Um, the advantage of you providing your logic inside a lambda like this is that it allows us to take care of this retrying, this error handling for you. Uh, you do not have to explicitly retry the transaction yourself. Um, 
So, and what about finally some more transient errors? What if I try and uh, replace a document here and a temporarily overloaded server returns a temporary failure exception to me? Um, well, how we handle errors like that is um, it differs from case to case. Um, some we simply retry. Uh, some will cause the transaction to fast fail. For example, if I'm trying to insert a document that already exists, uh, there's no sense retrying the transaction. It's going to fail again, so we will fast fail that transaction. Um, and some errors will cause the transaction to retry. Um, the wider point here is not so much the details of how each individual error is handled, but that error handling is complex and to the extent possible, uh, the transactions library aims to try and handle it for you. Uh, so would help us be making improvements and tweaks to the underlying error handling algorithms over time. And the advantage of this Lambda design where you provide your logic to in the Lambda is that um, you will benefit from any changes that we make uh, with no application changes needed and no explicit error handling required. Um, you simply tell us what you want done and we will try our best to make sure that happens. Um, finally, uh, what about some more catastrophic errors? Say that your application crashes right in the middle of this lambda. Um, well, there's a distributed background cleanup process that all transactions clients contribute to. Uh, this is responsible for finding and completing failed transactions quickly. Uh, 60 seconds is the default. It, it is configurable. Uh, completing can mean rolling back if the transaction had not yet reached committed otherwise rolling the transaction forwards. Um, the wider point again is that the error handling is handled for you and it's automatic. So if you don't have to think much about error handling, what do you actually need to consider as an application developer? Well, there's three points I wanna to touch on, three things to keep in mind. First is that we provide a read committed isolation level. Uh, this provides excellent performance, um, but it's important to know that it has some limitations. Uh, for example, if you read the same document twice, um, this is not guaranteed to have the same value. Customer to could have changed in that interval. Um, so you do not have snapshot isolation going on. Uh, number two, there is some unavoidable overhead to transactions in any database. Um, so we recommend that you arrange your document model as you always have with Couchbase, which is to try and avoid the need for atomically updating two or more documents at the same time. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with customers and orders, maybe have each customer have an orders array field rather than using a transaction to create a new order document and link it to a customer. Number three, uh, in this initial release, and this is very important, um, it's crucial that you not do transactional and non-transactional updates on the same document at the same time. Now we appreciate this can be a significant limitation in some use cases and it's one that we certainly hope to address in a future release. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can use the event bus mechanism I mentioned earlier uh, to be alerted if this rule was found to be broken. There's a particular event, uh, a legal document state that will indicate that that has happened. Um, so at least that you're aware that this, uh, this has occurred. Um, and that is it. So uh, to recap, Couchbase Distributed Transactions offers a simple API with automatic error handling, and it's available for Java right now in beta form uh, with other languages to follow. So we'd love to have your feedback, so please hit us up on the forums or Gitter. I'll provide links to those two below or in the comments on this video or the accompanying blog. And that's it from me. That's been Graham from Couchbase, and thank you very much for your time.